How do we do it? <coughs> well, of course, it's not necessarily easy to do it. Uh, we need a bit of practice and students need guidance. Um, writing is a very powerful way, particularly on your own. So sitting down and just writing the story down about what just happened to you and why it's a problem. It can also be a way of organising your thoughts. So you can use things like um, tables, Venn diagrams, mind maps, stories, all kinds of ways of collecting your thoughts and putting them into some kind of a way that you can observe them. One particular way I like is to use a single page and you might divide that page into a number of areas and put your thoughts under headings. So for instance, it might be about the progress of your particular project. So you might put things that foster your project over which you have control. In another corner, you might put things that foster your project over which you have no control. Then consider the flip side, things that inhibit your project over which you have control, things that foster, uh, inhibit your project over which you have no control. Now you have a way of making sense of what's happening in your particular project. But you can move out of your own project and think about things from different viewpoints. So for instance, many students spend a lot of their time thinking about their project and them now in their project. And that's obvious and that's what's going to happen to you, but that's not the only thing we need to do. So you might, for instance, start thinking about it through different lenses, through me, through the lens of my client or whoever I'm talking to, through the lens of the organisation or through the lens of the wider community. So it's also a way of breaking you out of just thinking about yourself in the moment and into something that's much broader than that. I also find that taking yourself on a mental picnic is something that works, particularly when you start to think about the overall shape of your project or of your career or of where you're going in your, your plans. And the mental picnic is particularly powerful in making sense of what you're doing, but also looking at your accomplishments. We spend so much time thinking about the things that are going wrong with our projects or our life or where we're going that we don't take stock and start to think about the good things that have happened. And that's as an important part of reflection as anything else. You don't just have to do reflection on your own, however. Talking to other people is a very important way of reflecting as well. And this can be a buddy, it can be your spouse, your partner, your, your mother, your sister, your brother. It can be someone else that you're talking to in your own, in the unit that you're studying or in small groups. Sometimes creating something together in a small group is another powerful way of reflecting. But any of these techniques can be used, they can be interspersed, they can be adapted and changed to your own particular needs. It's also about how, how you reflect and who you reflect for. Um, Many times you will write down just what happened to you or you will journal something or you'll just record it for your own. These are what I call raw reflections. And those are a powerful thing for you as a person, but they are for you only as a person. If, however, you need to consolidate those reflections in some way so that another audience can see them, you need to find ways of doing that. And these are what I call distilled reflections. So they might be in response to a set of questions, for instance, that are given to you by your unit convener. They might be just writing a narrative in a way that it'll make sense to someone else, not just you. You've used shorthands in your raw reflections, but you might need to actually make it into more of a narrative for someone else. It might also mean that you need to think more deeply. Sometimes having your raw reflections to go back through and look at can give you much longer insights or much deeper insights into what needs to be into the future. So using your, your, your raw reflections for another audience or even to go back over and see if you can get more insights from them for yourself are powerful ways of working through this as well. So we do have an over-reliance on journaling and I think that is unfair to students. It's unfair to how we assess students because if we have a diverse student body, we should have a diverse way of allowing our students to document reflection. Here at Macquarie, we've had a workshop recently on creative ways for documenting reflection. And we have looked at opportunities such as dreams and using dreams and as a form of reflection for learning. We have looked at techniques such as um, a student experimented with using Twitter for reflections and was very successful. We had a wonderful session at looking at art, drawing for reflection and how that it actually elicits a very different type of and level of reflection compared to just textual reflection. Um, I would like to see uh, music 
brought into it and other artistic forms. I have a goddaughter who's a student here and is about to go overseas for her participation and they are asked to photograph each day for their um, reflective data collection really and how wonderful is that. So I think we need to really broaden our scope of how we go about reflection. There's, there's, there are many different ways and I'm thrilled and proud that we're exploring those here at Macquarie.